Hi, and welcome to my talk about gradually implementing Istio for your platform. In this talk, we'll be exploring a way to figure out your starting point, your destination, and the steps between those points to have a gradual and safe implementation of Istio. Most of the material in this talk is based on conversations I had with other end users and our own experience when implementing the service mesh for our platform. First, a little bit about me. My name is John. I've been doing platform engineering at Wecamp in the Netherlands for about seven years. I've also been doing consulting for a very long time. And that's mostly been revolving around DevOps culture and cloud architecture. If you have any questions or have any feedback, you can reach me uh, on the CNCF Slack and on the Istio Slack and even on the Kubernetes Slack workspace, all using the same handle. So let's dive into the gap that we're going to be bridging. I'm going to assume that you already have a choice, uh, made a choice to use a service mesh or at least are heavily leaning towards implementing one and you might already have a non-meshed uh, system running. So figuring out what's inside of this, this, this opening, this gap, uh, what we need to put there to get to our end state, that's what this talk's all about. So your starting point is probably Kubernetes, but it might also be something else. Uh, Istio does work with various other systems, although it might be a little bit more to get it working. For example, virtual machines or servers or edge devices are all going to be supported. Looking for one of the more features in the surface mesh uh, deployment, that is probably uh, also a starting point requirement. If you're not looking for a surface mesh, you might not really want to employ or deploy one. And then there's the accessing expectations. Uh, so you probably already have some running applications or some users or some plans that you uh, need to support and adhere to. Then there's the destination, which is slightly harder to predict. But for my conversations, it's usually a combination of ingress control, internal communication, and observability, which are all very handy to have. We'll go into detail about those features uh, a little bit later. So getting the starting point right is pretty important because that uh, all through implementation, that is going to influence how you uh, perform each step and what the impact is going to be. So I've split this into three topics. There's existing knowledge, there's infrastructure context and there's available resources and together they have a pretty huge impact on how you might implement this. So your containers, Linux or Kubernetes experience that would come in handy, uh, but it's not the only existing knowledge that will come in handy. You might have uh, one of these products or something totally different and one way or another, some of the knowledge that you have gained when using or operating them, uh, that will come in handy when implementing a service mesh because lots of the knowledge that might not be say named the same or terminology might just be slightly off it usually boils down to the same stuff um, so having some existing knowledge and taking inventory of that uh, that is important because that informs how much uh, of a learning curve you might have and then there's the infrastructure context so for example you might have existing systems and the connectivity of those systems may not be uh, interruptible or uh, it might be preferred that they not be interrupted while you're implementing something. Same goes for uh, dependencies the other way around. So if you are inside your cluster and you want to talk to something outside of the cluster, well, maybe you want to make sure that that also keeps working. Now, not everyone requires this. Some services have uh, expected downtime, so that might apply to you. But if it applies to you, something to take into context or into consideration. Then there's security and compliance. So you might have existing uh, rules regarding that. Um, and you might have existing users. So uh, making sure that you don't interrupt their work too badly or in unexpected ways is also very important. So looking at those two, uh, and we'll go fill in the blanks uh, in a bit, they uh, impact your learning curve because how much you can use also kind of applies to how much you will have to learn and uh, how much you have to change will uh, cause some friction. So uh, fewer changes or safer changes will result in less friction. And then there's the indirect impact uh, of your speed and scope, because if you have to maintain a lot of existing uh, uh, features or connectivity, then your scope might get very broad. Um, and if you have a lot of existing knowledge that you can reapply, then your speed might be very high. It also works the other way around, of course. But there's another factor that also uh, seriously impacts your speed and your scope of your implementation. That is the available resources. So if you uh, don't have the uh, people and uh, the time to implement and maintain everything, maybe you want to spend some money on a third party supplier to help you with that. 
or it could be the other way around. Maybe your budget is somewhat smaller, but you do have time to uh, build and support everything. So then you might do everything in house or some balance in between. And these resources, um, they will uh, generally also impact how many features you deliver at once and how safe that is to do. Uh, so if you have a very, uh, uh, if you release very often uh, and you have a couple of environments, say you have a development environment and a sandbox environment and a production environment, it might be uh, safer and easier to deploy a small set of features many times, uh, not the same features obviously, um, but it gives you a, a, uh, a relatively safe way to do things. On the other hand, if you have a slower release cadence, uh, perhaps you might bundle more features at once, um, but you have to do more testing and more validation ahead of time. So how do you apply these, these, these topics to a real world scenario? Well, for us at Wacom, and uh, for some of the people I've talked to, it was uh, some reusable knowledge. So for us, uh, we already had some platform experience that was relatively relatable to Istio. Um, including uh, scheduling and orchestration and containers and generating YAML because duplicating the same YAML by hand and keeping it all in sync, that's not really uh, a lot of fun if you have enough services to configure. Um, but also metric with Prometheus helps a lot because a lot of the observability uh, does depend on uh, you using the metrics that are available in Istio to uh, act on. And you can use Prometheus or other tools, but in this example, and in our case, we use Prometheus. And then there's the infrastructure context. Uh, so uh, we had a relatively high release cadence, but we have smaller sets of release uh, of features per release. And because we had multiple environments, it was also relatively safe for us to experiment. And we were using Git and deployment systems so we could roll backwards and forwards without breaking too many things at once. Uh, and there were also uh, existing websites and backend services that we could not modify. So uh, those had to be uh, kept alive during all the implementation uh, phases. So that is how it worked for us. But lastly, the resources, uh, we didn't have uh, much of a budget for ongoing uh, support. So we couldn't really uh, have a third party manage the control plane for us, for example, uh, which can be a very uh, useful service to uh, purchase. But we did have a little bit of a budget to help us kickstart the implementation. So. We had some time with some people, but not everyone had the same amount of knowledge. And uh, uh, we figured that uh, having some consultants come in and do some pair programming uh, would be one of the ways uh, that we could improve our knowledge and also keep our speed uh, to a level that we uh, wanted it to be. And because we had full ownership and no frequent releases, uh, that was something that we could choose for. But that might, of course, be different in your situation. So. Now that we have a starting point and an example of how such a starting point was created, uh, let's look at the destination. So this diagram is a somewhat simplified version of the uh, architecture. Uh, it's available on the architecture overview page on the Istio website, um, but it gives you an idea, of the, an idea of the layout of where all the components are. And if you uh, look around, you have uh, some rough sections. There's a section control plane and there's some stuff in there. There's another section data plane. There's some other stuff in there. And there are, of course, the existing services that you might already have. Now, if we were to uh, take this, this idea that we have a couple of locations with different purposes and we go browse the documentation site, uh, and there are, of course, plenty of sources where you can go look for um, uh, features that are available or ways in people are using this, um, then, uh, well, documentation site, uh, always has all the features because, well, uh, it's documenting everything that's possible with Istio. So uh, just as a reference, uh, it might be very useful uh, to just browse it. So what we did is we uh, went and looked at the concepts and the tasks. So the concepts and the tasks have similar uh, topics, uh, but for example, the traffic management and observability were very important to us. So we first read through the uh, some of the concepts and then uh, decided that, uh, well, we have an idea of why we want this and what it does, but let's see how hard it is to do the things. And that's where the other section comes in handy. There's tasks for traffic management, and policy enforcement, and security, and they inform you a little bit about how much uh, work or how much knowledge it takes to do certain things. Now, if you uh, need a little bit more of a complete example. Of course, those exist as well. Uh, just as there are uh, uh, a lot of presentations and 
past issue conferences contain a lot of um, uh, user uh, stories about how they're uh, using Istio and what features they're using. Um, but yeah, the examples give you a, a, uh, a composed uh, working system that uses certain Istio features. So it became very useful uh, for you if you don't really know yet which features you will be using and in what combination. This is a, uh, a very good uh, point to check out. So if you look at the documentation, in our case, we also talked to a bunch of other end users. Um, we found that these six uh, things, uh, not all of them, but most of them, most of the time, are uh, the topics that people are most interested about and also the uh, most uh, desire to implement as fast or as soon as possible. So uh, let's uh, see how we can actually take those six topics and bridge the gap. So we have a starting point. And we, uh, of course, uh, it's not possible to represent everyone's infrastructure, but let's pretend that it is at least similar to this. So we uh, might have a bunch of microservices and they are uh, using an abstraction as, uh, uh, as a way to package all the resources for a service. So when a developer wants to deploy it, they have a hel essentially a Helm chart and it's a version. So they have a Helm chart of a specific version. They supply the values and the Helm chart will make sure that all the resources that they need are deployed in their own namespace. So uh, this also requires a working Kubernetes cluster and that uh, in this case, in this scenario, we have the ingress connected to a load balancer. So it's not directly exposed to the internet, but the load balancer takes care of that. And then uh, all the ingresses uh, that you have, they are using a load balancer controller to receive traffic. So if we take this starting point and we say, we want to start with the ingress gateway, how would you go about that? Well, uh, we want the ingress gateway for a couple of features, central observability and routing. And because the ingress gateway isn't deployed with the application, but inside the cluster, on its own, it means that you're controlled on the ingress gateway, applied to everyone, and they cannot really be uh, circumvented as such. With the ingress, you can essentially make your own rules and do whatever you want, but that's because it's delivered with your application, and this one isn't. On its own, the ingress gateway doesn't do anything, so we also need to start with the basics of traffic management. Now, why you would want traffic management at all? Uh, well, it said it in the name to manage your traffic, um, but it gives you service specific rules and it is uh, also used to connect a service to a gateway. So the traffic will only flow if there is a resource that says this service would like to receive traffic from this gateway when these conditions are met. And then you also have advanced uh, routing features. We can't go into those in this talk, uh, but that is something that uh, you get as soon as you enable the possibility of using traffic management features. So. Let's look at the diagram again. Where would these two items, this uh, the basics of traffic management and the ingress gateway live? So you have the data plane section and there is your existing service. And we want to make sure that the ingress of traffic works. And we also want to make sure that it actually arrives at a service. Now to do, do anything, you first need to have a control plane. And uh, that's where we're going to start. The control plane enables everything else. Um, well, it enables the installation of everything else. Um, but yeah, let, let's start with that one. So you have your Kubernetes, you start with your uh, control plane, you then add your ingress gateway, and then you can do your uh, first traffic management tasks. So let's look at these in a more uh, uh, practical sense. So I've uh, added some elements to the uh, to your diagram. We now have an ingress gateway and an STOD uh, on the site that's living in its own uh, location. It's not embedded in the namespace of the application. And the application now also has a virtual service resource. So how this works is you install the control plane. It's very well documented. It's essentially one command to install the base uh, custom resource definitions and another one to uh, install the STOD, so the daemon that actually controls uh, everything. And there's another command to uh, then add an ingress gateway. Um, so those two, uh, you can essentially out of the box use them. There's no additional configuration required. And um, that essentially sets you up for everything else. So then the third step was the basics of traffic management. In this case, it means that we need to create a virtual service resource. And uh, that essentially is uh, going to be the connection between the gateway and the service where you want to receive the traffic. Now, there are, uh, when you implement it, there are no real side effects of, to this. So you can actually do this without uh, bugging anyone, without breaking anything all the uh, current traffic flows will keep working. In a way, you 
yeah, uh, you can do this without anyone noticing. And there are, of course, multiple ways to install it. So there's Helm-based installation. Uh, Istio CTL can do uh, a lot of it for you. You can generate manifests and use those, uh, perhaps with uh, customize. So there are multiple options. Now, let's dive into this virtual service for a second. Um, this is essentially a resource that says, uh, if this gateway, uh, in this case, the gateway is named Ingress Gateway, receives uh, some traffic, uh, check if the URL is prefixed with cool. If it is, send the traffic to destination my cool app. And in this case, my cool app is the name of the service that you deployed. So that's all it does. It doesn't say, oh, stop all the other traffic or break the existing ingress. It doesn't even touch anything else. So if you were to abstract your application, you, know, you could essentially release a new version of your Helm chart, if that's what you're using, and simply add this resource, and that's it. So a very safe way to implement this. However, it doesn't do anything right now. So the question then remains, uh, do you just deploy this and then move on and do something else? Or do you perhaps want to deploy something that actually does something? So uh, first choice is deploy this as is. Doesn't do much, but it's super safe. But it might also mean that you now have like a billion deployments that first do nothing before you get to a point where you can do something. Um, but yeah, the second option uh, at this crossroads is um, we're going to modify everything at once, and we're going to make sure that the traffic immediately goes into the virtual service, into the Ingress gateway, and the old path is really broken. That will be uh, more of a uh, big bang uh, implementation, perhaps useful if your release cadence is uh, slower, um, but it does uh, require everyone to move at the same time. But there's a third option. And the third option uh, allows you to uh, uh, let everyone pace it at their own uh, well, desired speed. So let's look at this option three. So we take this uh, existing diagram that we have and we just add a new load balancer to it. And the new load balancer uh, will actually send traffic to the ingress gateway. And at this point, you can actually already use this uh, to send traffic to any service that also has a matching virtual service. It does work for everything, of course. So if your de developers are using a Helm chart that doesn't deploy a virtual service with their application, then those aren't reachable by the Ingress Gateway yet, because the Ingress Gateway only knows about services um, uh, that are connected to it via a virtual service. So we can actually uh, uh, make that even more safe. So we can create a virtual service that is a wildcard service or a fallback service. And what it does is it catches any traffic that couldn't be served by a different virtual service. And in this case, we can then tell the virtual service, hey, anything you receive, um, just send it to the old. Uh, load balancer and then uh, any service that has been deployed with a virtual service can receive the traffic directly from the ingress gateway and any service that was deployed without a virtual service it will still receive the traffic using the old load balancer the old ingress and uh, can continue working as is you can even roll backwards and forwards without breaking anything uh, this does require an additional resource. So you have your virtual service that configures the bypass or the fallback traffic that's essentially a wildcard it accepts anything. And Istio makes sure that this wildcard uh, service is put at the bottom of the priority uh, chain, uh, because you would, of course, not want to capture any traffic that you have a actual service for. But Istio doesn't know anything about uh, your old load balancer, because it's not a service and it's not inside the mesh. So we do need to inform Istio about this. So what we do is we get a service entry, which essentially says, if you see this host, uh, it is located outside of the mesh. Uh, here's the port, here's the protocol, and uh, you can find it using DNS. And now Istio knows about it, which means that any traffic that you send to the new load balancer will hit your ingress gateway. The ingress gateway will say, yes, I am aware of a service that can handle this, or no, I'm not. And in the last case, uh, well, it will be aware that the wildcard service exists, and that will then uh, forward the traffic to the old load balancer. And this way, your developers can now deploy an old version of your chart or a new version of your chart, and the traffic will always work. There is, of course, uh, a couple of extra hops now included. So if you're using the old way, or your developers using the old way, it means that their traffic uh, has a little bit of extra latency. But uh, that's about it. Uh, so it's a pretty safe way and a pretty staged way to uh, uh, allow a gradual move towards uh, mesh integrated traffic. But uh, that, of course, uh, leaves us with not a lot of new features. We have moved traffic over, but that's about it. And that's not what we wanted. We wanted those uh, sweet service mesh features. And this, in pretty much all cases, is going to require you to have a sidecar uh, proxy, because that's where actually all the magic happens. Now, 
I'm talking about sidecar proxies here, but uh, there is a different mode for the mesh and that's called the ambient mode or ambient mesh. And uh, that uses a different system, but achieves the same thing. Um, there are other presentations at this conference and the previous conference around, uh, explaining the actual ambient mesh and what features are and aren't supported. It's currently in beta, um, but yeah, it's for this example, it doesn't really matter because once it gets released, uh, the way you work with it will be the same. So uh, let's talk about this sidecar proxy. So uh, we have uh, a little bit of ingress gateway that's done, and we have uh, uh, some traffic management, but nothing else. So this injection will enable observability and security and authorization um, because uh, it actually has access to all the traffic coming in and out of your pod. And that's something that you need if you want to observe it or secure it or do anything with it. So. The observability features that you would gain is uh, traffic inside, but also who's talking to who. So it will know uh, who the originator of the request was and who the destination is. And this also is a precursor to other facilities. So for example, let's pick Kiali. Uh, that's a great tool to visualize what is actually happening inside your mesh. Um, so yeah, it's 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 kind of a, a almost, that's not necessarily required, but it's a must have uh, because this will uh, well enable a whole world of other features for you. Security-wise, uh, the most important parts are traffic encryption, so it does mutual TLS, and it also has cryptographic identities for all of your pods. Uh, so it means that uh, there are identities that cannot be faked uh, because the uh, essentially the sidecar, uh, the, the proxy that's injected, that manages your identity. So it means that if you have a container in a pod that tries to talk to the outside world, um, the uh, container proxy or the, uh, uh, the sidecar proxy uh, will attach that identity to it. And you have to implement uh, some of these security features to get access control. And the access control, based on that identity that you get, that the cryptographic identity, allows you to say who can talk to who based on identity instead of just port numbers or uh, network-based policies. So it's protocol-based, which uh, gives you uh, a lot of fine-grained features, which can be very useful. We'll go into that a little bit later. Um, but yeah, if you if you take a look at it in steps, you can gradually uh, add sidecars, which then enables you know, observability, security, and authorization. Now, essentially, observability and security could be in different orders, but sidecars has to be done first, and authorization only works if security works. So let's go into it. So I've removed all the uh, other uh, resources from the diagram uh, that are not relevant for this part. And what we're going to do is we're going to update the configuration to inject a sidecar into the pod. Now, you can do this cluster-wide, so you can say everything must have a sidecar, but you can also uh, do this based on the namespace or even based on the pod. And that is, of course, controlled by your replica set and your deployment. Um, when you do this, uh, it is important to keep an eye on your applications because there are some edge cases where uh, an application might be doing something uh, that needs some additional coordination between the sidecar and the application. So. All it takes is adding a label, and uh, the label can be set if you package your application using a chart uh, by your chart. Uh, you can also do it with customize, of course, and if need be, you can do it manually. And as soon as you uh, have this label set and you start a pod, uh, Istio will notice this and it will inject the uh, sidecar. So it is that simple. And because it's packaged with the application, everyone can uh, do this at their own pace. So uh, you don't have to uh, uh, do it for everyone at once. Um, but only for the uh, pods that actually have a sidecar, uh, that's where you get the additional features. So that's good to, to keep in mind. But again, gradual. So what this gives you is, and this is a somewhat more complicated diagram from the security documentation, uh, gives you a uh, encryption and control points everywhere where the proxy is located. So your service doesn't need to implement it, it is implemented for the service inside the proxy. So that's why this uh, injection is so important. Now, if you go a little bit more simplified, um, this uh, means that if your pod talks to another pod, that's both encrypted and identified. So that's also where this observability comes from. Um, and it also means that um, uh, if you, for example, were to enforce this, you can't have any plain text communication anymore. Now, that does mean that if you enforce it on a workload that is not used to it, or say an external workload, 
um, you might run into trouble because if you say MTLS is now enforced and by default it's permissive, but you say it's now enforced, it means that if anyone isn't upgraded yet with an injection, um, with a striker injection, they can no longer communicate correctly. So uh, it's important that if you were to, uh, for compliance reasons, for example, want to uh, strictly require it, uh, it can be quite tricky. So yeah, you can do it gradually, but if you make it enforced, uh, you might want to have to wait uh, a little bit to make sure everything has a sidecar injection done. So now you have those features, you have your traffic metrics, your security status, because that is something observability will also tell you. It will tell you uh, what is the security status of this uh, request. Was it using MTLS or was it using plain text? Um, and you also get uh, an automatic metrics endpoint. So if you were already scraping your services, uh, Istio will append the additional metrics to your metrics endpoint. So you don't need to set up any additional configurations in Prometheus. This is very nice. Uh, security also uh, is automatically implemented because uh, by default, it gives everyone MTLS, it gives everyone identity, and it is also always an enforcement point for policies. So by default, as soon as you in uh, enable injection, you get these practically for free. So you can of course configure them with more exotic configuration, but it's not required. So. Let's say we want to also add uh, some uh, uh, access control, some policies. Uh, an example scenario would be a REST service, uh, and you want to make sure that metrics isn't accessible from the internet, but you want to also make sure that nobody can issue a delete command. Uh, for example, you need to quickly change that without modifying the application. The policy uh, can help you there. So a policy for your uh, uh, delete uh, uh, methods might look like this. We essentially say uh, if traffic uh, is matched uh, based on the label, in this case, the app is called My Cool API, then we deny the action as soon as we detect that it contains a delete operation or delete method. Um, so that is a very simple way to restrict what someone can do or something can do. For the other part, the metrics thing, that's pretty nifty. Because the traffic is uh, entering your cluster using the ingress gateway, uh, it means that the traffic from outside, which doesn't have an identity, is now given the identity of the ingress gateway. So the traffic comes in in your ingress gateway and the ingress gateway then communicates to your pod. And that means that from a mesh perspective, your ingress gateway is talking to your pod. So your source is the ingress gateway and the destination is your pod. So that means that we can say if our pod receives traffic from anyone, sure, give them metrics. But if it receives traffic from the ingress gateway, do not give them metrics, deny it instead. So very powerful, uh, but also gradually uh, uh, implementable. That's a real word. You can scope them uh, to a cluster, so then it applies to everyone, but you can also scope it to your namespace or just an application, which again means that if a developer would want such a policy, they can choose to add it to their deployment. Uh, and if it goes wrong, wrong, they can roll it back and then it's removed. So the impact is very small. And uh, if you want to require a policy for everyone, you would embed it in your chart and you would wait until everyone has upgraded to that latest chart version. Now, there is a little bit of a but in here. If you do things wrong in your policy, well, maybe your service is no longer reachable. There is this uh, very important graph that will help you prevent such uh, uh, errors. So by default, everything is allowed, uh, but you can have a custom or deny policy that, that changes that behavior. But what is important to keep in mind is as soon as you add a single allow policy, even if it's for one small specific thing, it will block the default allow policy, which means uh, you no longer allow everything. You allow nothing except the thing that you explicitly allowed. So uh, yeah, uh, start with allow policies as a, uh, uh, a last option, uh, if you can uh, avoid it. And that brings us to the last uh, feature. So if you want to gain the features of an ingress egress gateway, um, uh, but which would mostly be a metrics for the outside world and management for services that you don't own. So, for example, something that lives outside of the mesh. And uh, it is not necessarily the only way to do it. If you remember, we did something with a load balancer. Um, but if we look at uh, a slightly more complicated scenario, and you won't dive too deeply into it, um, you can uh, supply a service entry and a virtual service with your application. So, for example, if your application is talking to an external API, and you would like to uh, collect metrics just on what that API is doing, uh, adding a service entry for the external API and a virtual service that refers to the service entry uh, will then allow any uh, of your software that is already making those calls to be instrumented. Because 
if you add a global uh, Eclipse gateway to your cluster and you have a virtual service that refers to that, uh, then that is the path that will be taken by Istio when sending traffic out to the internet. Of course, if there is no matching service uh, and uh, there's no uh, strict mutual TLS, um, I think your traffic will just equal to the internet by itself and it will not be instrumented, which would mean that your developer has to do it manually inside of the source code of their service. So this is a very nifty feature as well. Um, there weren't as many people I talked to that were actually free, you know, using it, uh, but those that were uh, using it, they were uh, super happy about it. So yeah, it's good to know. So that was all uh, I could fit in this presentation. Um, I hope you learned something or at least uh, enjoyed uh, watching this. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, well, you can reach me uh, using the handle uh, I mentioned at the beginning. So I hope you had a uh, good presentation and I hope you have a nice conference. Thank you for listening. <laughs>